Rak Saini, Ji Ayanu, and welcome to the sixth BM Singh Memorial Lecture. I'm so glad to see so many of you here today in this lovely, lovely venue. Thank you to Jasminder Singh's family and the whole team here at the Mayfair uh, for hosting us here once again. As many of you know, the lecture is in memory of the late Bal Mahendra Singh. He was an active and proud member of the Puthar Brothery and whose legacy as an entrepreneur and businessman continues to be a shining light for our community. Sadly, the pandemic has affected us all over the last two years. And really, we really must remember those that uh, we have lost over this time, as we're, especially now as we're getting back to normality. But I'm proud to say that the Putar Association adapted to the situation quickly. Uh, we started a series of online lectures and seminars. We helped to arrange hot meals for those in need. Uh, and we also um, made a number of videos encouraging vaccine take up. Um, but uh, actually, in the midst of all of this, we also managed to embark on a landmark project. And that is to produce a documentary and exhibition tracing the history of our community. And I'm so glad and really looking forward to be able to share this documentary with you here today. It was made possible by a grant from the Heritage Fund, and it tells a story of how people from the Puttar region were affected by partition and migration to the UK. So now I'd like to introduce you to our host for today, uh, Sweetie Kapoor. Now, Sweetie, she's a creative producer and a champion of contemporary arts and culture. She's a radio presenter and is behind Brown Girl in the Ring, a series of live events that shines a light on pioneering South Asian women. Sweetie. Hello, everybody. Um, firstly, thank you, Bobinder, for inviting me to host this very special event here today. It's an honor to welcome you all to the Patois Association's sixth annual BM Singh Memorial Lecture. Now, this year's event is a very special one. It's against the backdrop of 75 years of Indi India's independence, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and it marks 52 years of the association. As many of you will know, courtesy of the pandemic and lockdown, they were unable to celebrate their 50th year. So it's very special for them to have you all here today to celebrate it. And to mark the occasion, this year's lecture will be followed by the Pride of Papua Awards and the premiere screening of their film, Children of Partition an oral history of Pathwaris. And this is part of the Asian Film Festival, which is now in its 24th year. But now to the BM Singh Memorial Lecture. This year's guest speaker is an eminent economist on the world stage and the former deputy chairman of the Planning Commission of India. We are delighted to be joined by Mr. Montaik Singh Alawalia. He served in key roles as a high-level government official in India, as well as the IMF and the World Bank. And he was a pivotal figure in India's economy reforms and modernization. In 2011, he was awarded India's second highest civilian honor by the President of India for exceptional and distinguished services. He's also written extensively on development and economic reforms, and in 2020, he published his book, Backstage, the story behind India's high growth years, in which he gives an account of how economic policies in India transform the country from a highly controlled economy to one that is much more open and integrated with the rest of the world. I'd now like to invite Mr. Montaik Singh Alawalia to deliver his lecture titled Overcoming the Challenges to India Becoming a Five Trillion That's right, a five trillion dollar economy. <laughs> Please join me in giving him a warm welcome.
Well, thank you. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Let me begin, uh, first of all, by thanking the Potuhari Association and its president, Mr. Chaudhry, for extending the invitation to deliver this lecture. You know, I was uh, invited to participate in the, in the film that has just been mentioned. Uh, and so I interacted with the film people and uh, I think I'm part of maybe one or two minutes of me will be inflicted on you in a much broader uh, film uh, later on. Uh, but, you know, I never realized that I was a Potohari, although I was born in Rawalpindi. And as all of you know, at least many of you know, that the Potohar region is a tiny little region of two or three districts around Rawalpindi, uh, near the board, just, just to the bottom of where the mountains begin. So it's a sort of a plateau. Uh, and uh, they said, well, you know, you're from Rawalpindi, so you're, that's Potohar and you're a Potohari. And that was interesting. Uh, and I sort of read up about it. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, unlike, I mean, India is a place with enormous diversities and identity and even in the past separate uh, princely states and so forth. Uh, Potohar is not like that. I mean, Potohar was always a part of whatever the Punjab was. It was never a separate uh, sovereign entity within the Punjab state during Ranjit Singh's time or earlier. And if you check out with people, the main thing they talk about uh, is that the Punjabi spoken in Potohar is not exactly what it is elsewhere. Actually, the Punjabi spoken everywhere varies quite a bit. We don't realize this so much because increasingly uh, languages are getting uh, homogenized. But the fact is in different parts of the old Punjab, uh, Punjabi was spoken with, very, with some differences. And it's interesting to talk to linguists because I did talk to a linguist expert who tell me about Potohari and what it does and you know where it's different and so on. I thought that quite fascinating. So if you're if you're maintaining um, some record of uh, Potohar, I hope uh, you're conveying to your kids uh, that it's also in the linguistic differences that the real identity uh, rests. I mean, otherwise, it's really a part of Punjab. And the experience of uh, people from Potohar who got uprooted because of partition, migrated it probably in the first instance to India and then elsewhere in the world, uh, is not very different from the experience of other Punjabis from other parts of the Punjab which did the same thing. But of course, you know, uh, uh, whatever basis you have for defining uh, an identity, uh, if it's cultural or linguistic, makes sense. Uh, and in this particular case, it would be interesting to see how many people are actually aware uh, of what is the difference between the Potohari Punjabi and the non-Potohari Punjabi. I, I discovered the importance of these differences uh, just personally, because, you know, uh, way back in the 90s, I had to visit Pakistan uh, on an official delegation. We were having some discussion between the two finance ministries. And, you know, my wife, uh, who never used to accompany me on official delegations because she felt that, you know, she did her own traveling. And she said, if you want to take a holiday together, let's do that. But I'm not coming with you just because you're going there officially. But since Pakistan is not an easy place for an Indian to visit, uh, she said, OK, if you're going to Pakistan officially, then I'm coming along. And you better ask for a visa to me. So she did come. And of course, you know, uh, virtually every woman that she knew, at least in the family, uh, said, you must get us a Lahori Jutti. I wasn't even aware that Lahori Juttis are different from other Juttis. So we went, uh, to, uh, we went to a shop and the chap was sort of urging her to try uh, the footwear she had chosen. And it struck me that, you know, whereas in Delhi, uh, the same kind of guy in the same kind of position would have asked her to put it on and try it, and he would have said, to see chal ke dekho. But, uh, but in Lahore, he said, to see tur ke vekho. Slightly different, uh, recognizable, but it's interesting how languages change. I'm sure that's true of English. I mean, after all, the English that was spoken 50 years ago, uh, or more, 70 years ago, 
is really not the English that is spoken now, certainly amongst the elite. I mean, in the old old days, uh, there was a sort of, there was the English spoken by the elite, and then the rest was an undifferentiated uh, uh, mess of variation. Uh, now, of course, the, the, that English spoken by the elite is now somewhat discredited and made fun of, uh, and genuine people are supposed to speak in a genuine tongue. So, I mean, we're seeing similar, similar phenomena uh, in India also. I want to also mention, by the way, that um, uh, our High Commissioner Gayatri Kumar was invited to come to this function, and she called me up uh, a couple of hours ago uh, to apologize uh, that uh, I think Lord Swaraj Paul lost his wife recently, and there was a memorial service today at 4 o'clock. And she said, please explain that I have to drop out because of that. Uh, otherwise, I would have loved to come. And she told me that, you know, she herself did some research on what is Potohar and discovered that maybe she's a Potohari too. <laughs> because, you know, her daddy apparently was born somewhere in that region. And she was also telling me that her daddy spoke Punjabi in a slightly different kind of way. So you have a, a convert at the highest levels of the High Commission, and I believe you're, you're meeting her on the 11th, so you should, you should tell her that she's missed quite a bit. But anyway, uh, she was very kind and said she apologized and wanted me to explain uh, why she's not been able to come. Now, uh, now to the subject. You know, uh, I thought that you would first have the film, and then I would kind of weave my story around the film. But I think uh, the organizers somehow feel that it's a good idea for you to be subjected to a lecture on the economy of India before you move to a more entertaining film. <laughs> so I should apologize for being the spoiler in the show. I've also been warned that although there are one or two economists present and one or two of them have actually come and introduced themselves, I should try to stick, stay away from detailed technical economics. This is meant to be a lecture for a much broader audience, and I hope that I uh, live up to that expectation. And I think the, um, uh, when I was introduced, uh, there was an excitement that I'm going to talk about when are we going to become a $5 trillion economy. Now, you know, uh, slogans change uh, gradually over time. And, you know, when I was in government, the slogan we had was all related to growth, uh, GDP growth. And of course, we all realize that growth alone is no good, and it has to be inclusive, and it has to be sustainable. But the slogan was inclusive and sustainable growth. But you know, governments change, and new governments need new slogans. And suddenly, the slogan we got was, uh, we're going to be a $5 trillion economy by 2024. This is not very different from the old growth rate uh, because if you are almost three trillion and you want to be five trillion in a certain period, then there is a certain growth rate that will get you there. And since there's also inflation in the world, uh, you have to adjust for inflation. So if you're really talking about real growth, you can ask the question that what is the real growth rate that will get you to five trillion dollars? assuming that global inflation will be about 3% or maybe at the most 4%. And if you do your sums, that boils down to something like growing at 8% per year in real terms. So really, uh, anybody who asks me, when are we going to uh, become a $5 trillion economy? I mean, my answer is that, look, we will certainly become a $5 trillion economy, whatever the growth rate because if it's a lower growth, it'll take longer. And if it's a higher growth, it'll take less time. So we're certainly not going to become a $5 trillion economy by 2024, because around the world, growth has been seriously disrupted uh, by the pandemic. And now you have the Russian-Ukraine conflict, which God only knows how it's going to evolve. Uh, but no easy solution seems to be around. And that will certainly slow down the global economy. It will also slow down India. But I wouldn't worry too much about that because the real question is, uh, are we going to continue, go back 
to a high growth path. And I think what has happened in the last two years, uh, like everywhere else, I mean, we also dipped badly, maybe more than many other countries. And then we've begun to recover from that. So the last year's growth rate in India looks quite good because it follows a year when the economy had contracted. Uh, but the real question is, uh, now that we, I think we've roughly got back now to where we were in 2019-20, which is before the pandemic. So the question is, having got back to before the pandemic and therefore lost two years effectively, uh, what's going to be the growth rate moving ahead? And that's really where the debate is currently focused on. I think, uh, the, if you like, a cautionary note one has to strike is that COVID is not yet over, although I notice that you have declared normalcy in, uh, and in respecting your sentiment, I've taken off my mask. Uh, but actually, factually, I'm told it isn't over. So uh, um, you, cannot, you cannot say that, you know, the COVID dangers are past. And certainly the Russian-Ukraine conflict continues. Uh, so how fast we will grow to some extent depends on how these things play out in the next year. But, you know, the expectations vary. I mean, they vary. The pessimists think India will grow at 5%. The optimists think we may be able to do 7.5%. That's really where the range is. And, you know, even organizations like the World Bank and the IMF have sort of gone to the 75 level. Uh, some other people have said, no, uh, it's not going to be that good. I don't want to go into that because it gets too technical. Bottom line is, we'll get to $5 trillion, if not by 2024, maybe two years later, three years later. But remember, $5 trillion is not very important because $5 trillion is just the total size of the economy. I mean, what you really want to know is how fast is the economy growing and how fast is per capita income growing? I mean, after all, if India were to double in size and double in GDP, we would become a $6 trillion economy. But I don't think we would be a more important economy because of that. I mean, yes, a little bit absolute size makes a difference because the number of Mercedes bought will be double. Uh, but the truth is that if India remains poor, or relatively low income, then it's not a very important, uh, it's, not, it's not pulling its weight. So if it really wants to do well, it needs to grow more rapidly. And I think, at least in India, most people seem to think that whoever is in charge should deliver. Uh, they will say 8% growth, but to be honest, if they were to deliver 7 plus, uh, most people would be willing to concede that's a pretty good performance. So the real question, if you're interested in the future of India's economy, is does India have the capacity to grow at something like 75 and 8%? Remember, uh, when population grows, then the growth rate of GDP has to be adjusted by the growth of population to judge how much is per person GDP growing, in the sense that if the GDP is growing at 7.5% and population is increasing by 1%, then the per capita income growth is actually 6.5%. You know, 6.5% would be a pretty impressive growth of, pop of per capita income looking at the history of developing countries. Very few countries over a long period have achieved 6.5% growth. I mean, during, uh, during the Industrial Revolution in, in the West, per capita growth was not at that level. Per capita growth was much lower. It's just that if you do that over 100 years, uh, lots of things happen. So what we are doing is we are trying to compress uh, what the industrialized world achieved in 200 years, trying to compress that in 30, 40 years, something like that. And from that point of view, uh, a growth of 7.5, if we get, will in fact lead to lots and lots of improvements. Now, of course, you know, whenever people look at India, I find that uh, when I visit abroad and I meet Indians abroad, uh, they have sort of mixed reactions uh, to India's economic condition. I mean, in the very, very early phases of the Indian diaspora, when they were all coming out of a poor country and occupying the lowest uh, income levels in their country of adoption, though their income then 
or still better than what they left behind. The dominant concern really was the preservation of culture, connections with family, and India was important because that's where family was, that's where the culture is, and nobody bothered very much uh, that it's a poor country. It's kind of taken for granted. But you know, in any immigrant population which then has children born in the country, you know, the parents have a kind of understandable desire that the kids should sort of somehow be connected to the home country. But the truth is that as, as uh, family relations, etc., cetera, uh, many of them have emigrated themselves and otherwise in any case <clears throat> this connection weakens, it's likely that the next generation will not have the same connection. The only thing that they would have a connection is that as, as British citizens of Indian origin, what is the image of India? And can I have some water? Um, so I'm saying, you know, as a British citizen of Indian origin, uh, what is the image of India that matters? Uh, from that point of view, uh, one thing that matters quite a bit is are Indians thought to be smart or are you thought to come from a culture that just produces very inferior people? Now, from that point of view, we're doing incredibly well because if you look around uh, the corporate world in the world, some of the top corporations are being run by people of Indian origin. I mean, the Sundar Pichai's and the Satya Nadella's and until recently, the Indira Nui's, Ajay Banga in, uh, I don't know if Banga is a Potohari. You must check that, by the way. <laughs> it might be interesting. Uh, Vindi Banga, who lives in London, etc., etc. You can mention a large number. So from that point of view, uh, to say that you're an Indian, uh, you can you can you feel good that there are the world has recognized many first rate and of course there are similar people in the academic world and so on and so on. Uh, but then, from a purely commercial point of view, uh, what is interesting is: Are you coming from a country that's actually developing or just stagnating? You know, you you can have a situation where you have a wonderful culture and you love the music and you even love the theater, and the country is stagnant and it's produced a lot of very bright people who are all immigrated. So you can tell everyone that, listen, I come from the same genetic stock as uh, Satya Nadella and, and so on, uh, but I'm afraid the country is not doing well. But that's not going to be a very good uh, uh, context to make your children think well of India. And that's really where uh, the economics comes in. I mean, for the diaspora and for their children, if you want them to remain interested in India, it matters if India is seen to be doing well. Uh, uh, there are market opportunities there. The corporations that these guys go to uh, hire them in, in the belief that, you know, maybe you will be able to do some real marketing in India because that's an expanding market. So I think that's really uh, one dimension uh, where, from our point of view, and also in, in reaching out to the diaspora, that's a message uh, of some significance. I think another message which is very crucial is there's not enough uh, to talk about uh, just this expanding size of the market. I think increasingly it is necessary to talk about um, some of the socio-political values uh, because increasingly the global economy and, and, and Western leaders keep emphasizing this, talk about you know, uh, uh, authoritarian closed economies versus open and more liberal economies. Now, definitions vary, and you know, it's not easy to come to a precise conclusion, but India falls in the second category. Uh, and I think from that point of view, uh, a person of Indian origin, although a British citizen, 
would want to take interest in whether the enormous diversity of India uh, is kind of actually reflected in the way the society is moving forward. This is not an easy thing to achieve. And around the world, uh, we are seeing stresses and strains in societies, and we're not an exception either. But I think these are the different dimensions uh, that uh, we need to look at, not just the narrow uh, economic dimension. But having said that, uh, economic performance uh, impacts these things. I mean, uh, if you're worrying about health, which is a very common, common concern today, uh, particularly in the aftermath of COVID, you know, I think it, people have to realize that, of course, you want to be able to say that India has done a wonderful job on health. But India's not going to be able to say that if India's growth doesn't expand, because that's where the resources come, which you can plow back into health. It's also true that you can have the resources and do a bad job of plowing, plowing them back into health. But the first stage has to be you've got to have enough resources. The second stage is that somebody says, OK, you've got the resources and built five hospitals, but are they running well? And, you know, this is, a, this is a common across the world and is something that India needs to think about a lot. I would say most people would say that uh, during the period from about 2000 onwards after the economic reforms had set in, I think the Indian economy gave, gave everybody the, the impression that with liberalization, which essentially gave a much freer run to the private sector, got out of the old pro-public sector hang-up, which we did have very strongly in the 70s and even a little bit in the 80s, uh, the economy did well. All kinds of new companies came up, all kinds of new industries developed, all kinds of software and all that kind of stuff, and they did very well. So in that sense, uh, it took time for these uh, changes to actually reflect themselves in the economy. But I think they did reflect themselves uh, in the economy, and the economy did well. More recently, uh, other changes have been taking place which have the prospect of uh, improving performance in future. The most important of those, of course, is the whole digital revolution. Now, you know, uh, India uh, for some time has been trying to sort of develop a much broader telecom infrastructure, much broader penetration, access to the internet, and all these things. And in some respects, uh, what has been done on the digital uh, uh, side is actually quite path-breaking. Uh, the whole Aadhaar uh, uh, way of being able to give identity to individual citizens and the ease that it introduces in opening up bank accounts and financing transactions and so on, has greatly stimulated uh, the growth of digital transactions in India. Uh, it's still uh, one, of those, one of those totally transformative things uh, which we're seeing before our very, very eyes, and it, it will still evolve. Uh, but a lot of people think that the transformation that digitalization will bring about uh, will get re reflected in a much greater efficiency in the economy. There are, of course, traditional problems. I mean, in the sense that India does need to have a much, much better physical infrastructure. Talk about digital connectivity. Uh, <laughs> uh, much, much better physical infrastructure. And that is happening. It'll, again, it will take time. Uh, but, you know, anyone who's visited India and traveled around on the roads between cities and that kind of stuff... Uh, would testify that things have got a lot easier. But of course, you know, they're not what they should be. I mean, that's very clear. And again, if you compare the infrastructure with China, uh, it's very, very inferior. Because I think what the Chinese have done, I mean, they have the capacity, they have a government that can do these things without interventions. Uh, nobody goes to court if somebody has to build a road through their land, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, the Chinese have built actually world-class infrastructure. The Chinese physical infrastructure is better than the American. We are kind of trying to catch up. So, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the comparisons that are made on whether India is doing well or not uh, relate to how, how are other developing countries doing. And, you know, from that point of view, uh, 
there's no question that if you look at what China is doing on the economic side, it will dwarf uh, whatever India is doing. But if you compare India with other developing countries, then there's a clear sense of catching up in the sense that it's not as far behind as it used to be. But, you know, let's face it, uh, it's only moved from being what they call a low-income economy to being in the bottom of the middle-income economy range. And the real question is, can we get out of this middle income, bottom of the middle income economy range to get to the upper end of the uh, uh, middle income economy range? And what does that mean? I mean, right now, uh, probably per capita income in uh, India is something just under $2,000. Uh, in Indonesia, it's twice that. Uh, in Thailand, it's a little bit above that. So really, we need to get from, say, $2,000 per head to something like six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 per head. That's a very significant increase in per capita income. It can only happen if you get a lot of growth, 7 8% growth in 20 years or something of that kind. And that is really what we need to aim at. And the question is whether we can do it. Now, it's not very easy uh, to chart out uh, whether you're going to do it or not. But to my mind, one of the most important things is, uh, do people set the right targets? Because, you know, nobody can actually tell in precise detail uh, what you need to do if you set the right target. Because uh, opinions vary, and anyway, uh, circumstances change. But if you set the right target and you're relentlessly monitoring performance on whether it's meeting those objectives, the hope is that governments will end up kind of doing the right thing. Uh, and I think that right now, over several different governments, uh, individual governments never like to say they're doing the same thing that the other government did, because you know politics is an important driver. And I'm not aware of any uh, US or British uh, head of government who said that, you know, I'm more or less doing the same thing that the previous lot did. But the fact is that these countries do well because there is a broad national consensus on what to do, which changes here and there. And I think that in India, that broad national consensus at the moment is that, number one, we need a lot higher growth than we are getting. Number two, that must be reflected in higher incomes for the bottom end. It's not enough to have very high growth, which gets concentrated at the top. And so the ones at the bottom get barely anything. That will just not work. So everybody is aware of that. I think there's also an understanding that in order to get there, the private sector has to take a lead role, which was not the case in the 70s. In the 70s, the view was that it's the public sector that will play the dominant role. That's not the view today. In fact, today the view is that the government has an important role to play but not directly in production. Uh, the two, three sectors where the government must do a lot is in building infrastructure, in education, and in health. Uh, and even in these, the private sector now has a significant role. But the question really is that what people raise is that is the private sector's involvement in it uh, a fair involvement with a pressure of competition, or is it likely to be subverted by some kind of crony capitalism where people who are favored industrialists get all the benefit. Now, these are questions that are being asked even in the West. And it's very interesting how exactly the same thing uh, is being said uh, in India. The, quest the questions are the same because, frankly, uh, social media, SMSs, WhatsApps, this, that, they throw these questions around the world and they move around with an incredible speed. And generally, all the negative stuff uh, is circulated over and over again. And the positive stuff is very rarely re retweeted or recirculated. So people are very aware of what the problems are. Uh, and, and not just the problems at home, but the problems also abroad. So I think this is one consensus that broadly, if you're going to get there, it's going to have to be uh, because the private sector takes a lead and it should be competitive and it should be given freedom and should get better infrastructure and things like that. I think one of the biggest problems in India is that the, uh, and most Indians are aware of this and successive Indian governments 
I've also acknowledged this, but to be honest, I don't think that we've done enough. Certainly, we didn't do enough, and I don't know. The present government says it's going to do it, so good luck to them. But that is that the processes in India, the, the, the detailed regulations, etc., are, are still uh, uh, far from what they should be if you want to have ease of business operations. Now, the only good news is that if you were to ask the prime minister, do you agree with this, he would re- immediately say yes. But how to move from that realization at the top to actual implementation is a big issue. And mind you, almost half of the regulation of government is not done by the central government. It's done by the state governments. So a lot of whether we succeed is going to depend on how many state governments uh, are innovative. I think this is, uh, unfortunately, in Indian politics, uh, state governments tend to sort of uh, view their challenges largely as... uh, the center is not allowing us to do enough, or the center is not doing enough, or the center is not giving us enough money. But the fact is that they have enormous flexibility. I mean, if you had a, a, a state chief minister who said that, look, half of what needs to be done for my state to do better depends on me, and the other half depends on the center. And I'm promising you that I'm going to do 90% of what is in my control we would immediately have gone half the way. But I think that's not happening. Uh, The debate is always the center is not doing something or the other, and maybe they're not. So I'm not saying that between the center and the states that the center doesn't, uh, center is always right. But I think we need to have a politics in which people start putting pressure on state governments to deliver on things that are in their area. And I think this is a very big uh, social change because, you know, the... Certainly when I was in government, the, all the think tanks in the country uh, direct their uh, energies really at the central government. Hardly any think tank was directing its energies at the state government. Uh, and yet it seems to me that we now have states that are ruled by different parties. Uh, frankly, we need much more awareness on the part of uh, the opinion makers that it is what the state governments do that will determine half the outcome uh, in terms of economic growth. Now, underlying all this, really there are, I think, three trends that I just want to mention, which you should all keep in mind. One of them is that the world is going through a terrific change in technology. I mean, I mentioned digitalization. That's just one aspect of it. But, you know, uh, this is a change of technology that is going to be enormously disruptive. Uh, And how well the country does is going to depend, A, on its ability to absorb the new technology and benefit from it. I mean, anyone who says, let's keep it out, that's a disaster. Uh, We have to absorb it and benefit from it. But we also have to realize that if we absorb it, then a lot of our traditional ways of doing things uh, will have to change. Uh, And there will be opposition to that. I mean, the most classic case, of course, is uh, e-commerce, where one of the things that the pandemic has done, I mean, even a uh, non-digitally trained fellow like me uh, started doing a lot more online purchasing uh, during the pandemic. Uh, So in a way, it has accelerated a trend which would have happened anyway over a longer period. But the consequence of this is that many of the smaller shops uh, are losing business. I mean, if you, in India, as in anywhere, if you want to buy a branded product, I mean, it's a different thing if you're buying a mango or a vegetable. I mean, people still like to go to the shop and look at it and say, no, this is not right, etc. But, you know, if you're buying a branded product from a reliable brand, Uh, you just buy it online. And you have to ask the question, what's going to happen to all these shops, which otherwise stock these products and sold them? Uh, The most classic case where you're going to get phenomenal disruption is pharmacies. I mean, virtually every locality in Delhi has at least two pharmacies, which is where people would go for their whatever, all their branded medicines. But you know, in this day and age, 
uh, all of those medicines can now be ordered online and with guaranteed delivery within two or three hours. So it's uh, most, uh, mo in most cases, that's the amount of time it takes before the doctor prescribes a, a medicine and you actually get to the uh, pharmacist to get it. If all this goes online, great for the online pharmacy business, and they are expanding. But one wonders what's going to happen to the fellows uh, who run pharmacies. And of course, the short answer is they're all going to be converted into coffee shops. So it's not a, you know, the, the fact is land is incredibly scarce in most Indian markets. But, you know, people who made a life selling pharmacies call themselves pharmacists. They're not very happy with saying, well, look, this business is now dead, but uh, why don't we set up a coffee shop here or a dhaba here or an eating business or something? Uh, so I think how this change occurs, this change is occurring, but it's, uh, it's being accelerated quite a bit. That's, that's one point on, on technology. Uh, the other point really is that uh, when, when, when we look at the system evolving, f mo moving forward, uh, it will it will be very important that uh, the sense of economic security that people had uh, doesn't disappear completely. And yet new technology means new kinds of employment or the gig economy, etc. So in good days, people took a lot of pride in the fact that it was generating huge numbers of jobs. But when the economy went on a downturn, all those jobs disappeared. And then everybody said, these are very insecure jobs. So what's the answer? Is the answer not have the technology or find some other way of providing more secure job? That's a big challenge. Now, I'm not going to go on and on because you have a wonderful film, which I also want to watch. Uh, so let me at that point stop. I mean, if there are questions, I'd be very happy to answer them later uh, if I have a chance. Is that okay? Thank you. There. Thank you, Mr. Alawalia, for that wonderful and illuminating lecture. We all look forward to India's continuing growth and the continuing growth of the diaspora here, the younger diaspora here, I should say, to take a further interest in India. I'd now like to invite Manveen Rana to the stage for the conversation and Q&A. Manveen is an award-winning investigative journalist. She's worked for the Daily Telegraph as well as a reporter for the Today program and The World at One. And she currently hosts the Times Radio podcast, Stories of Our Times. Um. I know we don't have long, and I will also veer away from the sort of technical questions on um, regulatory frameworks and the other things that you brought up, which are fascinating. We could be here all afternoon. Um, but I sort of thought, oh, that was such a great introduction to, to you and, and some of the things you've been involved with. But I, I think it would be quite nice for people here to hear a bit more about you and your background and your character. So, um, I mean, you... you, you went to Oxford and became president of the union back in the 60s, which was a very different, it was a very different place at the time. Um, tell us a bit about your experiences then. You mean how different it was then? Yes. I think it was the last uh, kind of uh, phasing out of it word in England. Oh, you'll need Oh. <laughs> Is that okay? Can I mean? Yeah. I think it was a phasing out of Edwardian England. And you could, you know, like, look, my dominant impression uh, when I went to Oxford uh, was that there was somebody there uh, who cleaned your room. And uh, uh, I mean, there was only a very vague similar, similar person in St. Stephen's College. Here, this guy would be there every morning, bring a jug of hot water and put it in the alcove next to a basin and would also polish your shoes. And you know, I had a friend uh, who was an American Rhodes Scholar, who, uh, and for him, uh, this business of somebody polishing his shoes offended his democratic instincts. <laughs> so he said, look, I don't need you to do this, I'll do it myself. No, no, sir, that's my job. 
Uh, whereupon Richard took to hiding his shoes so that uh, the scout would not be able to find them, but he wasn't able to do that. So what I mean is very, very <laughs> different. Uh, I don't, I'm sure they don't do that now, but I was quite surprised to find that the tradition of uh, the gentleman being served by servants was still there in the early 60s. Um, you were president of the union, which is usually the sort of job you do to audition for a political career. It's a, a factory for politicians and people who govern. How did you end up on the policy side, always being a civil servant rather than entering the fray in, in political terms? Were you ever tempted or was it a deliberate decision? So tempted to go into politics? Mm. No, no, never. I mean, I, look, debating, not everybody who went to Oxford Union debates uh, envisaged a political career. In fact, even many who envisaged a political career didn't go to the union. But this was sort of an upper class uh, kind of uh, pattern where certainly many of the people who were in the union then uh, later on became cabinet ministers and so on. More of them joined the Tory party than the Labour party, but you know. Uh, I, I think but lots of other people were actually interested, thought that they would go into other things, whether journalism, or sort of professional policy advice, which is really what I wanted to do, and that's what I did. Did you ever feel, though, while you were doing that, that you could have wielded more power or m been able to sort of um, push through reforms faster if you'd actually gone down the political line? Well, you know, that's, uh, I mean, everybody loves the idea of wielding power. But, you <laughs> know, uh, the great advantage of uh, uh, doing it as a, as a technocrat is that you don't have to explain to the people why it's a good thing to raise prices. Uh, that's left to the politician. So in some sense, uh, having a technocratic input and then telling the minister that, look, I know it's difficult to persuade the people, and that's your job. That's why, that's why you are where you are. So I didn't mind that. I had, I had no great desire to, and I don't think I had the skill to try and persuade the ordinary man in the street why something which he found was quite absurd was actually quite a good thing for him in the long run. It's very difficult to persuade people, uh, persuade people of that, you know. You talked a little bit about some of the successful Indians who've gone out into the world. And, you know, if you look at Silicon Valley now, as you mentioned, most of the CEOs are from India. After Oxford, you went off to the World Bank and clearly sort of had a, a glittering career. You were sort of the youngest um, person running a division. <laughs> What made you go back to India rather than pursuing a career in the Well, I, no, I, I always wanted to be involved in policy making in India. Uh, I mean, I had opportunities to get into uh, multinational corporations and I turned them down. Uh, the reason I didn't go back directly after Oxford was that the World Bank had been set up and was expanding. And I thought it would be quite attractive to join the World Bank and look at what other countries are doing. And in retrospect, I think that was actually quite very useful. I mean, I stayed there longer than I originally thought I would. Uh, and that also is understandable because if you stay there for three years, you get a very superficial sense. But I was there for a whole 10 or 11 years actually before heading back to India. And the India you went to was obviously sort of very different economically. Um, you know, it sort of seems strange now to look back, but even in the 90s, you know, we would all look at Asia and we would look at what we call the tiger economies then. You look at Japan doing incredibly well and India always sort of seemed to be stagnating. You've sort of been a key architect of how that sort of managed to change. I mean, just talk us through some of the things that you're most proud of pushing through. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I want to... Uh, uh, disavow the claim of being an arch. There are too many architects of this edifice. But I was definitely very privileged to be critically involved in the change and advising the fellows who were the real architects. Very modest. That's absolutely true. Uh, what were we... Mo I, I think, look, when I went back, uh, the dominant thing that looked wrong in India was the extent to which the economy had been closed off to external competition. I mean, foreign exchange uh, scarcity uh, meant that we maintained uh, an undervalued rupee, uh, an overvalued rupee, uh, and uh, that rupee imports were very cheap, uh, and therefore we didn't have the foreign exchange. So instead of devaluing the rupee and making imports uh, more expensive, we would allocate the little money we had to different people, 
which meant judging that A deserves it more than B, which is an absurd decision and certainly not one that any bureaucrat can usefully make. It was very clear to me that this is utterly dysfunctional. And I'm really pleased that we did manage to get rid of that. But mind you, it took a hell of a long time. I mean, I, joined, I went to the government in 1979. Through the 1980s, there was a sort of willingness to recognize that we are uh, using ex excessive controls, but not really a willingness to come to grips with it. Mm -hmm. So you'd have little bits of incremental change. It's only in 1991 that we were really able to say, look, this just isn't good enough, get rid of it. And that's what happened. And uh, even that, by the way, took three or four years. It didn't happen overnight. I'm not a great believer in the sort of uh, uh, overnight instantaneous reform. Uh, but I do think that if you make a case for why you must move in a certain direction and you move with deliberation, uh, the economy responds much better than people think. Uh, and uh, when people see that the economy is responding, uh, I think they begin to realize the value of that. Have there been periods when you've wanted to sort of speed that process up, though? I mean, you know, you mentioned China. So back in the 80s, if you looked at the GDP of India and China, it was roughly the same, and now it's four times as big as India. And you mentioned infrastructure, for example. I mean, I, I know you're, you're probably a, a big Democrat, but are there ever times where you sort of <laughs> wished you could push no, things through absolutely. a bit easier? Uh, I've, I've said that in my book also. You know, uh, I think we should have, what we achieved over 25 years, we should have done in half the time. Not instantly, but in half the time. China is very different simply because, you know, China, China has a politics, but it's a politics concentrated at the top of the party. China doesn't have to, I mean, if somebody in China can get uh, 1,000 people on the street, first of all, it wouldn't be allowed. And secondly, I mean, it would just make no difference. In India, even after you've got a consensus, if you can get 2,000 people demonstrating somewhere, people start worrying, oh my goodness, what do we do, et cetera. So, I mean, if you want an open society and if you want a more liberal society, you have to recognize that uh, this will happen and this will constrain you a little bit. Um, you mentioned how the, the, the five trillion dollar economy is sort of like the latest slogan and slogans do change. Um, but they're sort of, they're really important because they are a statement of intent. And when you were working on economic growth, there was a big emphasis, as you mentioned, on inclusivity, on bringing people with you so that even, you know, you can look at growth and be delighted that there are more billionaires in India. But if there are still people in shanty towns, those glittering skyscrapers yeah. don't look so great. How does India do that? How does India manage to, you know, why is it that even now when it's a, a, a big economic success, it's still one of the biggest recipients of aid? How do you bring um, the whole well, country up? It is not a recipient of aid. Uh, this is a mistaken impression. I don't know what your definition of aid is. It, it still receives a lot of British aid, for example. But how much, you think? I mean, by the way, Britain wants to give this aid. We never turn it down. Uh, <laughs> we are, I'm not aware that... Don't the tell us now India, you didn't need it. The government of India has <laughs> never, ever said to the British government that we need more aid. The British government says, look, we want to do, give aid because we want to help India, help the poor. So thank you very much. <laughs> but the aid we are getting is a, a minute fraction of the GDP. But it does still have a problem of a disparity in wealth. So how do you bring... Yeah, the, we have a lot of disparity. By the way, the aid we are getting is also a minute fraction of what would be needed to tackle disparity. Yeah. And the aid givers are also aware of that. Yes, how do you tackle that? I mean, look, that's why the slogan of inclusive growth was coined. And I think the present government has the same approach. They, they use the term sab, sabka saat, sabka vikas, not uh, inclusive growth. So Hindi for, you know, with everybody, for everybody. So the slogan is there too, over there. And I think most of the instruments that have evolved to make sure that the poor kind of get a reasonable share of the goodies, they're in use even today. Uh, that's pro I mean, for example, the, most governments today uh, are very, very concerned that we must do a lot better in agriculture because that's where still quite a lot of, although well, percentage dependence on agriculture is going down, a lot of people are still dependent on it. 
So that's, that was the strategy earlier, that's the strategy now. The problem of course now is that, you know, you need an agricultural strategy that will reflect the challenges of climate change. So the strategy that worked quite well in the 70s, fertilizer, use water, that kind of thing, is just not gonna work now. Mm -hmm. So we need a whole different approach. Uh, and that's, that's tough, basically. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. We, I know we are running out of time, and if anybody has an urgent question, please do put up your hand, and I promise I will try and do a couple. Um, but I did just want to ask you on climate change, because you are doing some work now for, for the IMF on climate change and COVID, and you know this mass disruption that we've all sort of seen, whether, will it, will it sort of uh, be an opportunity in a way for economies to adapt? Now that we've sort well, of... Well, I'm not doing any work for the IMF. I'm doing work on the subject. Yes. But... but uh, well, what, 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 I mean, what, what are your conclusions? What can no, India, think, for example, do to... I think COVID, to... COVID has very clearly established uh, that, you know, we were very, we are and have been weak in having the kind of public health infrastructure uh, that is needed if a country is going to be subjected to these kinds of things every now and then. And climate change scientists tell us that one of the risks of climate change is the growth of zoonotic diseases, sudden pandemics. And, you know, we never realized that uh, the, the meaning of a sudden pandemic is that the capacity for treating people in hospitals may suddenly increase fivefold. Now, this is a tough one to handle because if you're going to have that once in 20 years, do you build five times the number of hospitals for the entire period? Or do you build in the kind of flexibility that when it happens, you're ready to expand capacity, take over schools, and the, you know, whatever way you do, there are some costs. But we just weren't thinking about that. And I'm sure that they're doing more thinking on that subject now. You know, on the issue of agriculture, frankly, uh, what we do because the globe is warming up, uh, I don't think that uh, we fully realize the implication. Nobody does. Because, you know, what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to increase the level of precipitation and the variability. Mm. So you're going to get droughts more often and floods more often. So what you need to do to manage that is a whole different approach to managing water and conserving it. And it's practically, that's what all of us are trying to work on and hopefully uh, it will lead to the government doing things differently from what it was doing earlier. But it's not one of those one or two key things. It's, it's practically a, what they approach. call a whole of the economy approach, yeah. essentially. Uh, we had a couple of urgent ones, so I'll be as quick as we can. Um, did you want to go first? Can I come in? So, Sikal, my name is Tijinda. I have a couple of questions, actually, but one of them which is more dear to me, I always like and feel very privileged to be sitting in front of you to see that Mantek Singh Aluwalia ji is here. So thank you for coming. Uh, the question is that when I introduce your kind of caliber, your kind of experience uh, over the past many number of years with my family, with my friends, with my children, I particularly relate to one sentence which I would like to read from the book which you have. Uh, when Montek Singh Alawalia in 1966 got his congratulatory first, it is a time when actually the examiners stand and applaud. So when you entered that room, I would like to know <laughs> that what was your kind of feeling at that time when that kind of privilege, that kind of accolade, that applaud comes your way? No, actually, I, I have to tell you that I, I slipped that period because until shortly before then, the tradition was that if you, everybody before they got a degree was called for an interview, okay? And those were gentlemanly times, fewer people and all that kind of stuff. It's only that the ones who got a congratulatory first were not asked any question. The examiners just got up, took their hats off or the mortar boards off and applauded. But I'm afraid by the time I got into that position, they decided there are too many guys and we can't do that. So we, you would get a letter from the head, head of the examination board saying, I'm very happy to inform you that you've got a congratulatory first. So I didn't see this theater, but we, we, we were told about it. 
and I regret not being part of that theatrical performance. I no, I can further relate that answer with my family and children. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and a small another question. You mentioned about working uh, abilities of state with center and a, a chief minister should be actually, his 50% should be 90% to perform. Have you identified or seen any state as a role model or which demonstrated such kind of uh, activity? Well, you know, I, I, I feel a bit hesitant to identify individual states, although I'm not in government. I just don't want it to be attributed to uh, an official position at that time. But I can certainly tell you that across the states, the differences are enormous. Uh, and uh, uh, the poor perform let me tell you a story uh, which will explain the thing better because this comes not from my, I had written a paper on whether liberalization would lead to differential results in states. And I said, look, of course, you know, the states that are nearer the ports, the states that are more flexible, uh, and take advantage of liberalization are going to do better. But if others realize that this is why they're doing better and they start doing the same thing, they'll catch up. So I was giving a lecture in Chennai uh, at that time, and Murusili Maran, who was the minister, was chairing. Uh, and I was saying this stuff. But there was one person in the audience, obviously a more, more left-oriented, uh, keen kind of student, who said, but sir, don't you think that with these policies that you've introduced, the backward states will get poorer? So I was about to reply, saying I didn't think so, and Murusili Maran interrupted me and got up and said, I want to mention one thing. I don't think there are any backward states in India. There are only mismanaged states. <laughs> now, you know, the Tamil Nadu, the Tamilians have a very high opinion of the way they manage Tamil Nadu, and it is one of the better managed states. But apart from that, I'm not going to identify individual, <laughs> but there's no doubt in my mind that if somebody did a, a study, uh, it would be a very interesting issue that if X and Y and Z can do so much better, why are you doing so much worse? And we haven't done enough of that. And frankly, in government, it's politically very difficult to do that. I mean, I was deputy chairman of the planning commission, but you know, if I had gone and said, this state is not doing well, it would be a political issue. So we, we, we didn't do uh, as frank an assessment as we should have. Thank you. One at the back. Last one, I promise. Sorry. My name is Sachit Singh. Uh, my question to you is a few years ago, um, the economist identified one of the constraints to India's growth as being insufficient number of high qual quality graduates coming out through the system. We have some great beacons, we've got the IITs and Stevens and some of the other great institutions, but uniformly speaking, the view was perhaps India isn't getting enough to propel the growth. And one of the things it talked about was perhaps India needed to uh, loosen its visa regime to attract people from say places like Sri Lanka to be able to attract those people to propel uh, the Indian economy. What's your view on that? Because you've talked about a constraint being phys lack of physical infrastructure, but I'm talking about the lack of probably human talent in sufficient numbers. No, I, I, I have no doubt that you know uh, human capital is increasingly regarded as very, very critical. It's also true that uh, while the top uh, of our educational system produces excellent graduates, uh, by the time you get beyond that, the quality goes down. But you know, I've talked to a lot of people, and I think what they tell me is that uh, most of these guys, uh, they need only maybe three months or so of remedial focus training, and then they can do terrific things. I once went to ISRO, which is our space research organization, which after all is competitively putting up satellites around the world uh, and, and doing a pretty good job. And you know, I asked them, I, I said, I want to meet the younger people. So at the particular Israel lab, I went around meeting some of the younger people, and I kept asking them, where are you from? And I thought there would be IIT this and IIT that. There was nobody from an IIT over there. They were all from regional engineering colleges. And I asked the head of the organization, hey, how come the IIT guys aren't here? And he said, no, the IIT guys all go to JP Morgan and become investment analysts. 
But he said the regional colleges fellows are pretty good, except when they come in, we have to give them a kind of a four month training so that they really can hit the ball, hit the ground running. There's a level below that as well. You know, the regional engineering colleges as an example. Yeah. But there is a level below that where, where there's thriving on capitation fees and quality no, yeah. quite. It's, uh, that's correct. I mean, I think the industrial training institutes and so on, yeah. I don't think we've done a good job. And lots of efforts were made and still are being made to upgrade those in some manner. So what's you know, your Skill development is a huge problem and we need to do a better job. So Part what of about the, the visa problem that I mentioned? Hmm? You know, I talked about the fact that perhaps India needed to loosen its visa regime. That's a suggestion from The Economist as well, that you attract talent from other countries. I, I didn't understand. Did you say a visa problem? Yeah, they were saying that India had a more, needed a more lax visa uh, 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 regime in place to be able to attract talent from other countries to be able to uh, propel India's growth. Uh, you mean if you need skills? Yeah, if you labor, need skills from places like able, Sri Lanka, for yeah, example. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so your view is yes, we should be having. You know, I mean, technically, my view is that uh, certainly at the higher end uh, of technology, uh, we ought to allow uh, foreign citizens uh, to get visas if they're bringing in uh, technology that we don't have. But if you've got a, if you, if you're talking about just a, a guy who runs a lathe machine, and if you believe somebody from Sri Lanka is better, which they may well be, whether you should allow them to come in or do something about improving your own fellows becomes an open question. But I think at the upper end, I, I, I think as we are becoming, we want to be uh, at the frontier of many areas. We would have to be open and bring in scientists from wherever they are. Mm. Not at all. Uh, we could so happily keep doing this all afternoon. There are so many questions still to go, but I, I am in a world of trouble. I know I've completely uh, overshot on time. I'm so sorry. So I just wanted to invite the, the next generation of Portoharis to, to, uh, to congratulate you and, and thank you for, for your efforts this afternoon. Um, so this is Marissa, Shay, and Misha. Misha here? Nope, here she comes. Misha is actually the great granddaughter of BM Singh, uh, who this lecture is named after. And they've got a, a book marking the 400th anniversary of Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji oh, okay. for you. <laughs> Beautifully wrapped nice. I look for, by I the mother. <laughs> Very carefully wrapped, huh? Be beautifully wrapped. Ha, ha, ha. 